Well, 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 all right, everybody, I think we're going to get uh, started. Can everybody hear me? Testing, testing. Can everybody hear me? Cynthia, can you, can you hear from virtual land? Yes, in virtual land, a little louder would be good. Perfect. How about now? That's good. All right, perfect. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is so great to see so many uh, mentors, um, colleagues, friends. And my name is Leland Lazarus, if you don't know me. Um, I serve at Florida International University's Jack Gordon Institute of Public Policy. Uh, specifically focusing on national security and, and China and Latin America affairs. And really, we can't uh, choose a better time to talk about this topic because it is in the news right now. Right? Everybody, of course, saw the Wall Street Journal article about how Cuba allegedly allowed China to have an espionage base uh, right near the U.S. Um, and regardless on what you think about that, uh, it's just one more example of China's growing influence in this region. Actually, there's a Chinese saying, which is uh, 冰冻三十非日之寒, which translates to uh, three blocks of ice has not been frozen um, in a day. Right? It takes a, a long time for, for something to happen. And it's just like that here in this region. Over the past 10 years, um, 22 countries are now signatories of China's Belt and Road Initiative. I say 22 because just yesterday, the president of Honduras, Xiomara Castro, in Beijing, signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. So that's 22 countries now, which means that now uh, seven of the 13 countries in the world that recognize Taiwan are in Latin America and the Caribbean. And you see China's interest growing in this region from trade to renewable energy to dual use ports to law enforcement and even potential military engagement. And so we have incredible legends and exports uh, in this field of China, Latin America relations to talk about all of this uh, with us today and really help us think through the implications of China's growing influence in this region, implications for Latin American and Caribbean people and implications for US national security. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I first want to give the floor to Dr. Slomi Dinar, who is the Dean of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and a professor of the Department of Politics and International Relations. Dean Dinar's research includes international environmental politics, security, and negotiation, and he has been a part of several consultancy projects with the uh, World Bank and other international organizations. Dean Dinar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Leland, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really, thank you for joining us for this panel discussion. We're also live streaming the, the panel discussion, so folks are also joining us uh, virtually as well, or at least listening to the panel uh, remotely as well. Uh, the Green School is, is really uh, very pleased to be sponsoring this event here. Uh, in our nation's capital. I would like to acknowledge our Green School co-sponsoring partners, the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center, the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy, and the Dorothea Green uh, Lecture Series. I should also note that our Latin American and Caribbean Center was founded in 1979 and is one of only 16 national resource centers on Latin America in the country. And also, a very special thank you to FIU and DC and our colleagues here uh, at FIU in Washington DC for hosting us uh, this uh, afternoon. For those of you not familiar with the Green School, I'd love to share a few, a little bit about us. So first and foremost, through our eight departments that bridge the social sciences and humanities, along with several centers, institutes, and programs, we address many current international issues as we prepare the leaders 
of tomorrow. Our Mali UN team is ranked number three in North America and has been ranked a top five team for the past 10 years. In 2021, the Green School was named a full member of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, or APSIA, as it's popularly known, the only university in Florida to achieve this distinction and one of only 38 in the world, a world alongside universities such as Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Sanford, GW, Georgetown, and Duke, and many others. And in fact, uh, uh, just before this particular panel, FIU and DC hosted uh, APSIA for a number of, of meetings in this particular location. So it's wonderful to have this close relationship with uh, APSIA. Today, as Leland already kind of mentioned, we will be looking at the dramatically shifting situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Since the end of the Cold War, it was largely part of the unipolar world the region, with the United States and its allies the primary forces influencing the region's geopolitics. But in more recent decades, all the great powers, the United States, Russia, and China, as well as other nations, have been competing for influence and resources in the region as now a new multipolar world emerges. We're privileged to have with us a panel of experts who will provide insights on the current situation and how these developments may foretell future changes that could impact the region. I want to thank you again. Have an enjoyable afternoon, and I really look forward to seeing you all at the reception following the panel. And, and Lilo, I know you'll now be introducing uh, Tony, so please. Now I'd like to ask for our uh, panelists to come up uh, and also introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Anthony Pereira. Dr. Pereira is the director of the FIU Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center. And before this, Dr. Pereira founded the Brazilian Studies Institute at King's College of London. Um, he has an illustrious uh, background. He was previous <laughs> Fulbright and Fulbright Hayes Fellow. Uh, he got his master's and PhD at Harvard. And uh, there's no better um, professor to lead us in this discussion than Dr. Anthony Pereira. So, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Um, well, welcome to Great Power Competition in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think this is a topic that would have been very familiar to people in Washington 100 years ago. But they would have been talking about the British and the Germans and the French, not the Iranians and the Russians and the Chinese. So, um, you know, come full circle. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for being here. It's a great team. Um, Admiral, to my right, Admiral Craig Fowler is a senior fellow in the Green School of International Public Affairs at FIU. You're flying the flag for us. Thank you. Uh, you're a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Latin American Center and um, also at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. And uh, Admiral Fowler is also a senior fellow at the National Defense University and is on the advisory board of the Penn State Applied Research Lab. Um, Admiral Fowler has decades of national security experience, and he was the commander of U.S. Southern Command from 2018 to 2020, um, and will be drawing on that ex experience in the panel to come. Um, on the screen, Cynthia McClintock is a professor of political science and international affairs at the George Washington's Elliott School of International Affairs. That's one of the APSIA members, I believe. And her experiences, her expertise is Latin American politics, U.S. policy towards Latin America, Andean affairs, and Peru. Um, Professor McClintock has received fellowships from the U.S. Institute of Peace, Fulbright, SSRC, Woodrow Wilson Center, and in 20, 2008 received the Orden del Sol de Peru, the Order of the Sun of Peru, awarded by the Peruvian state for extraordinary contributions to, to Peru. Um, in, in the middle of the panel, Margaret Myers, I mean, I'm not forcing you to be in the middle necessarily in the issues, but just where you're sitting, uh, is the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Um, Margaret established the Dialogues China and Latin America Working Group in 2011 to examine China's growing, growing presence in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also developed the China Latin American Finance Database. Um, before that, she worked for the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, and it, it was deployed to the U.S. Navy and uh, has also um, worked for, uh, set up one of the first, country's first Mandarin language programs. 
Um, so I think has shares a talent with Leyland for, for Mandarin. And at the end of the panel, Ryan Berg is director of the Americas program and head of the Future of Venezuelan Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at the Catholic University of America. Um, he's also involved with the University of Oxford's Changing Character of War program and also studies Latin America's criminal groups in the region's uh, it, the role of criminal groups in the region's governance and security challenges. So I think it's, a, it's an extremely well-prepared panel, and I wanted to just go straight into it uh, with a first round of questions, um, asking, starting with Admiral Fowler, um, you were the SOUTHCOM commander, and you've stayed abreast of, of events in that region. What, what would you say about the strategy of China and other relevant great powers in Latin America and the Caribbean right now. Thank you, Tony, and, and thank you to FIU for hosting this discussion on something that's so important. The national defense strategy and the national security strategy in 2018 were so important because it recognized that we were in a competition, and that allowed an alignment and a dialogue on what to do about it. It also, I think, for those of us that were practitioners, and at the time I was in the Office of Secretary of Defense and his, on his staff as his senior military assistant, we were allowed to, to articulate what we had seen developing really for, for decades. Uh, that's important. These documents really set the tone. And it talks about competition, particularly with the China, and it set us out to really think about the dimensions of competition to ensure we could maintain that lead and ensure that democracy uh, was valued and democracy wins. What I saw throughout my, my three-year tour and since is that uh, China is a global power and it's far bigger and larger than economics. It's sort of a running myth I fought for the entire three years. I think it's no different now that we, we hear you, um, we hear your concerns, but it's economic at its heart. It's economic, but it's economic in all the influence and tools necessary. I'll give you two examples. So during COVID, I was very proud of the U.S. response. We didn't get credit for it. Um, we didn't really want to take credit for it, but we, we were out there with uh, the State Department, Department of Defense working together, vaccines, hospital tents, medical equipment for all of our partners, and we far exceeded uh, any other contribution of other nations. You know, we're not counting, but you know, sometimes the number of things does matter. But China got credit for doing more and being there first. I flew into the Dominican Republic. At the time, Leland was, uh, our, our kickoff was on our team, and I, we flew in with a hospital tent, and some. we really weren't advertising it too much. <coughs> Chinese flew in with a branded airplane full of vaccines uh, the same day. Three countries in a row, China delivered vaccines on the same day that the Southcom commander and State Department delivered other goods with a bigger branding campaign. They're clearly after influence. They're clearly recognizing the value of speed. Uh, but along with all those deliveries, there came strings, and there were strings attached. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to do the job of talking about those strengths. Sometimes we could, sometimes we couldn't. In one case, they, they tried to, you know, we'll provide you vaccines. You shift your allegiance uh, from uh, Taiwan to us as a recognition. Unfortunately, that country did not. Another example, IT. Well known uh, that there's a problem with transnational criminal organizations in our neighborhood here in the Western Hemisphere, 40 to, or 43 of the 50 most violent cities in the world are here. It's a cited fact. And so cities and countries want to do something about it, so they look for the most cost-effective security system. China comes along with well-packaged systems uh, that feed data right back to Beijing. And, uh, and no one can compete because you can't compete with a state-owned enterprise that bids unfairly on contracts. And then the ambassador for the U.S. Embassy would pull me to the window and say, if it's here for safety, why are there three of these new Huawei or ZTE cameras pointed right at our embassy? So this sort of thing is going on every single day. Uh, it, it's, it wasn't surprising to me that people were surprised that there was intelligence facilities in Cuba. It shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. That's been happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, if I could bring in Cynthia, I, I hope you can hear us okay. You, you're a scholar of Peru and the Andes. From your perspective, what do you consider to be the trends in China's role in the region? Well, first, uh, many thanks for the invitation to join this panel. It's uh, sorry I can't be there in person, but I am right here in Peru right now, and uh, so I can't. But uh, I wish I could. But um, it, it'll be great to continue continue the panel. And no, I, I agree 100 percent with Admiral Fowler that uh, China's uh, role has been increasing uh, dramatically. I do think it. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, there was uh, something of a hiatus, but it's. Uh, growing once again, if not quite as dramatically. And I agree, too, that uh, while the, the key uh, goal <coughs> for a long time has been economics, that economics overlaps with strategy and that there are strategic goals and political goals. And uh, I think that's been very clear uh, you know, for, 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 for quite a while. Um, looking at it from the vantage point of you know, South America, the the I think the biggest change perhaps has been the diversification of China's economic you know, interests and you know, as the Admiral would suggest, the tendency for those to be becoming more and more strategic. So right here in Peru, I think one of the biggest issues have been the, the ports and the construction uh, of uh, potentially two ports by China and what that would uh, that would mean. I think that's been a major issue and obviously there's strategic, you no, know, it's economic, but also strategic as the Admiral uh, would agree. I think in terms of trends, uh, I'm not an expert on China itself and you know, Margaret, others can perhaps provide more insights, but my sense is that China is also realizing that um, Latin America is not simple. Uh, that it's complex and um, working with the Latin American governments is not quite so easy as saying, hey, this is a leftist government and uh, it'll be friendly to us. Uh, I think that uh, China was probably quite optimistic about the uh, election of Pedro Castillo in Peru back in 2021, uh, but then to realize that Castillo was not going to be able to do what China was hoping. I think China has a major interest in, in uh, the mines in Peru, and in particular this one mine that there's been Las Bambas, which has been extremely uh, difficult for China. There's issues about controversy about the road. And I think China was thinking, oh, well, you know, Castillo, you know, he owes us something and he'll solve this problem. Well, he did not solve this problem. Uh, and then the Admiral mentioned vaccines. And uh, I don't, again, I don't know exactly what was going on in China's mind, but there was a huge scandal uh, about uh, VIPs receiving the vaccines first. Uh, and I, I mean, I think that it's interesting. I don't think that uh, from what I heard on the inside, there was indeed, just as the Admiral mentioned, these strings being attached uh, to the uh, distribution of the vaccines. I don't think that came out, you knowing the media here, but that is what I heard uh, too. But I don't think, you no, know, in general, I think China is having to kind of come to grips with the fact that. Um, you know, there are reasons why sometimes U.S. companies are not eager to, to go full stream ahead you know, in, uh, in countries in South America where there are you know, a lot of issues and especially a lot of these raw materials are issues of the port has recently had issues. You know, this is not a new story. This has happened in other Latin American countries. But I think you know, increasingly China has to be realizing that uh, it's a complicated, it's complicated politics here. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Margaret, you've, you've written about the challenge to U.S. competitiveness of the rise of China in the region. What, how do you see it? Yeah, well, thank, first of all, thank you all for the, uh, for the opportunity to comment um, for the special microphone, which, as I understand, gives me karaoke privileges or something <laughs> of that nature. <laughs> uh, exactly. No, I, so I, I, everything that I would say, I think, would complement exactly what, what Admiral Fowler and, and, and Dr. McClintock, McClintock have already mentioned. So I see sort of three general trends, probably a lot more than that, but three general trends in, in the economic relationship at present. Um, first of all, 
I, I call it a tapering, but that tends to be interpreted incorrectly. We are not seeing China leaving the region at all. If anything, we're seeing you know, a much more focused effort to engage, in, especially in specific geographies and in specific sectors. But a tapering, if you look at kind of the overall uh, statistics, whether on trade or investment or finance, and especially in the financial realm, trade continues to underpin the relationship absolutely based on China's food security, energy security, and supply chain security interests, right? Um, and in many ways, at least I, I feel this is the case, is contributing to so much of China's influence, economic influence in the region when you have China as your largest destination, most important destination for the vast majority of your of your products, even if they are primary commodities, then, then you tend to make decisions based on uh, you know China's interests, or at least try not to rock the boat. Um, on the investment side, or rather on the finance side, we see, you know, we've seen a rapid drop in China's state-to-state uh, -state lending, sovereign lending on the part of the policy banks, China Development Bank, China Exim Bank. But that's been accompanied also by an increase in finance from other sources, right? We've seen finance coming from the companies themselves. We've seen the commercial banks, Bank of China, ICBC, playing a really critical role uh, and really focusing their investment again. Um, and then we've seen uh, you know, finance also coming from a number of different multilateral sources. And indeed, that's a big focus right now for China, is working with a wide range of multilateral development banks to work on project development. So at the very first phases of, of the project, and, and really getting in there when things get started. On the investment side, we see ups and downs. There's no clear trend one way or the other, whether we're talking about mergers and acquisitions or greenfield. But what we do see, and this is my second point, the second trend, is a real focusing, a focusing of investment on those sectors that China deems most critical to its economic growth. Uh, China has called these in the past new infrastructure. That's a term that's not been used with as much frequency now. But nevertheless, this encompasses all things innovation, right? All things tech. We tend to think of ICT and Huawei and surveillance technology, but it can also be high-speed rail or ultra-high voltage transmission lines or really you name it, anything, you know, data centers, all of it. Um, and then beyond this and related to this process of focusing is a process of, uh, of localization. And so, you know, China engages at all, all levels of government, including at the regional level through mechanisms such as platforms such as the China SELAC Forum. Uh, bilateral engagement has been a feature of the relationship since the very beginning, since two decades ago, right? But increasingly now, and because of, you know, some of the political shifts, for example, that Cynthia mentioned, um, there is an effort to engage at the subnational level far more extensively to get deals done. It also, in part, because some of these, you know, deals are indeed struck at the at the subnational level. If we're talking about lithium, uh, you know, uh, Argentine provinces have a lot of authority over over what happens. If we're talking about smart cities or safe cities, same is true. You go to the muni municipalities. You may have to get buy-in from the government, but you go there first. So these are sort of the these are the three trends I'm seeing. They have wide-ranging implications for the competitiveness of U.S. firms, of of partner nation firms, um, and then just. Two other things. This is an inflection point. I'll also say that. This is a moment when the region is coming out of a crisis. By all metrics, it's doing really badly. And China is bringing to bear a lot of resources in sectors that these countries, these even municipalities deem most critical to their economic growth. And so it will be a matter of, you know, seeing how these things match up. At the same time, and I think Cynthia mentioned this as well, we're seeing a rethinking in China about what is risk how to characterize it, how, much, how many resources can be brought to bear in support of certain projects, whether they ought to be, uh, what kind of projects generate the quickest and biggest revenue. So a real rethinking of risk, which also will affect, I think, project development looking ahead. And then the last point, of just a bolder overall approach, right? <laughs> whether we're talking about Obviously, the Cuba thing is not new at all, right? But certainly, this is you know just one more, uh, one more move, right? Uh, just 90 miles off the coast of the U.S. to demonstrate you know China's China's efforts and interests and intents as concerns uh, the U.S.-China dynamic and its engagement with the region. We see 
you know, uh, really aggressive stance on uh, as concerns Taiwan. Um, this base, this or this, uh, not, I call it a base, but the the port in 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 Argentina now in Tierra del Fuego is a really interesting other development, whether that materializes or not. So, much bolder. We used to see, what was it? T 10 years ago, eight years ago, a lot of writing about, oh gosh, should we bother the US? I don't, we don't want to cause any sort of reaction. You know, we shouldn't do, the, shouldn't do this investment. That era is over, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, you know, we moved far beyond that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Ryan, you've written a lot about Chinese strategy in the region, the rising influence of China, including on the issue of Taiwan you know, trying to persuade the seven states in the region that still recognize Taiwan diplomatically to switch sides. What would you add to the, to the discussion um, in terms of understanding uh, the Chinese strategy in the region? Well, uh, <laughs> this actually dovetails with a conversation that I had with someone in the audience this, uh, just this morning. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's true. We still have seven countries in, in the region, uh, four in the Caribbean, two in Central America, one in South America that, rep that recognize Taiwan diplomatically. Uh, marry that with the 22 countries that have signed on to, to the BRI. Uh, assume that the U.S. and Canada aren't going to sign on to the BRI anytime soon. You're down to 33 countries in the region. Subtract seven from that. You've got almost all the countries that either aren't the U.S. or Canada or don't, or, uh, don't recognize Taiwan as having signed up to the BRI already, right? Uh, so really, if we're looking at things like BRI expansion uh, as, a, as, a, as a, an element of Chinese strategy, and there's a good debate about whether that's still a central pillar of strategy or not, Margaret's done some great work on, on that topic, um, China has to reverse some of these, some of these uh, diplomatic recognitions in order to, uh, to advance um, with new countries that it doesn't currently have engagement with. Um, just mathematically, right? I, I did really quick math there, but you, other than Brazil, Mexico, there, there aren't too many other countries uh, in the region left, uh, Colombia as well, uh, for, for China to, to engage on, on the BRI uh, level. Uh, I think for a certain, to a certain extent with where China engages or how it engages in various parts of sub-regions of Latin America and the Caribbean um, determines the extent to which the Taiwan question is, is important. Obviously, in South America, it's really not that important at all uh, because you're really only talking about Paraguay. Um, it's slightly more important, I would say, in Central America, although I think it's, it's still less important than it has been in the past, given the number of countries we've seen move away from Taiwan since 2000 and uh, late 17, early 18. Uh, and it's probably more important in the Caribbean as you still have four countries, <coughs> excuse me, there that recognize uh, Taiwan. So it, it really depends on the sub-region of the overall hemisphere we're, we're talking about in terms of uh, the, the importance of, of Taiwan to, to China's strategy and Chinese engagement. Um, one thing I would say is, and, and this comes out of uh, a set of research that we're going to release at CSIS soon, looking at um, these after-action reports that the ICDF, the Chinese, uh, sorry, the, the Taiwanese uh, Development Agency releases after they've finished development projects in the region, uh, is the, the distinctive approaches <coughs> that China uses vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan uh, when it comes to development uh, approaches and how China's um, trying to present itself in contradistinction to how uh, Taiwan does development. So Taiwan is very focused on projects that might seem to us to be very strange, right? Rural oyster cultivation in Honduras prior to the diplomatic switch might not seem like a super urgent uh, uh, development priority vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the Hondurans allegedly switched for, which is the hydroelectric dam. Um, so but what they're doing is they're very, very focused on not getting into a, a competition over resources, right? Over who can spend more money on flashy infrastructure. Taiwan has a very clear message in all of its development projects in the hemisphere, which is if you're interested in human capital development, if you're interested in uh, healthcare systems and digitalization of your economy and in rural sustainable agriculture, we're your better partner. If you're interested in the flashy infrastructure projects, you're probably not going to get them from us. 
Uh, that's the message that we took away after looking at about 100 of these things, uh, detailing projects in, in the hemisphere, and I think it has a lot of, of intersection with, with overall strategy as well. Um, you know, what Taiwan can do to protect itself versus simply what it can't do because of the way that it's chosen to engage with its partner countries in the region. Thanks, Ryan. That's a really rich set of uh, answers. I wanted to get in two other rounds, one on the kind of logic on the U.S. side and one on the reaction of the Latin American Caribbean countries to this great power competition. Um, so, Admiral Fowler, you gave some great examples there of Chinese vaccine diplomacy and other kinds of uh, types of influence seeking. What do you think the U.S. response should be? Uh, first, I'm going to put a plug in for Ryan's uh, recent report, Insulate, Curtail, and Compete. That's just packed full of great ideas on what we should do, that, that uh, we ought to grab on and just not reinvent the wheel and implement them. Uh, I'd say four things. W when China, I'd say the PRC, um, you know, acts in ways that are illegal, not in accordance with international law, the, there needs to be swifter and more facts-based reporting on it and research on it and data, and we, we need to be quick to get that information out there, and sometimes we're not, either because it's classified and we, we take a long time to release it, which is understandable to a point, or because there's um, you know, some perceived uh, penalty to pay by writing about it. I once asked a, a president of a university, why is there not more U.S. University, why not more research on what the PRC is up to and some of the clear uh, ways it's undercutting uh, international norms and uh, and it goes back to follow the money and where a lot of the, the students of uh, China are, are going to school. We've got to do better there, that's one. Two is if we recognize and our strategic documents say that we're in a competition and we need to compete we need to bring it. We need to go on the field, as Margaret said, and be bold and compete and not block our own shots, which we do repeatedly with a different policy or inconsistent application of policy. Uh, I'll cite one. There's a law out there, a uh, U.S. law, that says if a foreign country has implemented a law that allows them to shoot down an aircraft that they deem hostile, then we, the U.S., can't do security cooperation with them or assist them or share information, intelligence with them unless they go through this just heinous, huge, long process and get a presidential determination. And so far, I think we've got one country through that, uh, Colombia. And it's, it's a, a bar that, that shows no respect to our partners. So you know, don't block our own field goals. Uh, you know, when we meet with a partner, go with a basis of respect. Don't come in uh, and preach about the PRC. Uh, as you drive past a ship at the port unloading or loading legitimate economic products and you recognize that China is the number one trading partner of country X, Y, and Z, we can't come in and preach to them about what they should and shouldn't be doing with China. We need to talk about what we can do with our partners uh, as partners. We say partners are a strength. We need to put action where our words are there, and there's a lot of mismatch between the narratives and what we do and I think some double standards on how it's applied globally, uh, particularly in this hemisphere. And then the fourth, you know, one, shine a light on the PRC, two, stop blocking our own shots, three, be a good partner and a reliable, respectful partner. And the fourth is engage. A little goes a long way. At one point during the, uh, the 2021, uh, I noted 13 different engagements by President Xi with countries just in the Caribbean to one by our own president. So it goes back to partnerships and respect and engagement, and engagement matters. Thanks, Admiral Fowler. Um, Cynthia, how do, you, how do you see the U.S. role, either what it normatively should be in your view or, or what you actually see um, US, the U.S. state doing? In, Could in you, I can't hear you very well. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with a very similar question to the one I asked Admiral Fowler. Um, how do you see U.S. policy in this great power competition? Um, Cynthia, did you hear me? May, it sounds like right, I... Right, right. Very, very important. 
Yes. Um, I have a little trouble hearing you, but I think the basic uh, question is you know, the current trends of the current uh, U.S. role in, in Latin America and you know, how the U.S. can uh, achieve a better position Ex with respect exactly. to, to China's role. Yeah, yeah. I think that the primary goal of most of the Latin American countries is economic. So China has this key advantage, you know, that the government can direct investment, can play a role, and can, you know, just do a better job of directing uh, where companies go. And, you know, in the United States, of course, it's private enterprise, and, and uh, the Biden administration, no government can say, hey, you do this or you do that. And at the moment, my understanding is that, uh, at least in the South American countries, perhaps less Mexico and Central America, with it, but there's most companies do not look at South America right now and say, hey, no, let's invest in that port or let's invest in that railroad or let's, uh, no, and invest. Uh, lithium is maybe an exception. No, it's a really key mineral and there's a huge amount of interest. But on balance, I think, uh, again, United States companies have seen all these difficulties and challenges in working in Latin America. And right now, from what I hear, you know, it's sort of more advantageous a lot of the time to be investing in the United States. There's a lot of advantages. And so, you no, know, they're just not as present. And this is a big problem. Uh, and again, it's nothing that a government can do about it, really, or at least it's very hard to do something about it. But, you know, from everything I've heard, you know, it's just sort of China is the the game in town for most of these countries at the moment. I think Margaret uh, no alluded to that. But again, it's hard for us to do anything, but um, no, it's an issue and something that we need to think about and how we can counter that. Uh, I agree with Admiral Farrell that um, to the extent that the United States uh, is engaging and is engaging in other ways that you know, there's very little publicity there. And I'm not quite sure what the reason is. I'm going to address that a little bit uh, larger. I mean, I think right now, for example, there's preparation of, you know, sort of uh, military training here in Peru by the United States. And, you know, I've been here 10 days. <laughs> it got a tiny little mention in one of about 20 periodicals. This is not very much at the forefront. I think there are also new donations from USAID for, uh, you know, for the dengue. Um, calamity here, other uh, donations, and none of this receives much um, much publicity. And I think it's important, I'm going to mention this later, that sort of countries like most of the South American countries have so many problems right now, they tend to be focused uh, on what's going on internally. But, you know, it would be great if the United States could, you know, do a better job of reaching out and engaging and, you know, the fact that, you know, the United States did ultimately provide a lot of vaccines, et cetera. Uh, no, would be uh, would be very helpful. Uh, I think the United States has to be very, very careful about you know, not pushing too hard. I think the admiral got at this. We're not shooting ourselves in the foot, but you no, know, they're you know, talking about you know from the standpoint of a lot of the Latin American countries, they see you no know, Huawei is extremely cheap, which it is, and so they want it. And it's for the United States. We say no, you can't do this. Uh, it's seen as hearkening back to an era when the United States was, you know, pushing its weight around too much. And, you know, this is, you know, the, the Latin American countries want uh, their sovereignty. And, and uh, it's just, you know, all of these memories of past uh, U.S. You know, being heavy handed, it, it reminds them of that. And so it makes it very difficult for the United States to kind of call countries on, you know, when there are things that we would like them to do that they don't really want to do, because like, say, in the case of Huawei, it's just so much cheaper, it's just not uh, economically feasible, really, for most of them to be sort of backing away from Huawei. So, mm -hmm. so those are some, some uh, things. It's, it's challenging. It's a very challenging time, because on the one hand, uh, I think in the United States, there's this huge recognition that it is an important, uh, increasingly important, increasingly urgent uh, strategic competition. But on the other hand, for the Latin Americans, it's kind of, uh, let's see what how we can uh, improve. And you no, know, they're not looking at it and saying, oh, this is problematic, really. Thank you. Um, Margaret, so there's the sense that there's this competition, but it's asymmetric in some ways because of the different systems on, on both sides. What do you think could, could be done more effectively on the U.S. side? Yeah, so, I mean, we are at a, we are dealing with something of a paralysis right here. 
uh, especially as concerns trade, right? There's not a lot that we can do on that front. Most of our investment related or other form, you know, in engagement initiatives are, are, uh, are based on or intended to be private sector led. Um, and that's problematic because there have not been a lot of incentives, at least for certain industries, certain companies to invest in certain parts of the region. So I mean, with all of this in mind, we have to think what we about what we can do within these constraints. And again, Ryan wrote this amazing paper, so I'm going to try and be complimentary here and not <laughs> not repeat anything that Almost Ryan's probably the panelists <laughs> to say any of this. <laughs> no, the problem is, I don't want to repeat anything, so I'm going to try and see if I can't add something to it. But first of all, I mean, when these are private sector-led initiatives, and the private sector is not going. We have to ask ourselves why, right? And so it's a first sort of thing is to address those barriers, right? And that's not an easy thing to do. This is not a short-term solution, but obviously working with governments to try to, um, you know, to address the concerns that, you know, companies that are really rearing to go, they're thinking about nearshoring. They want to, you know, establish themselves in the Americas to export to the Americas. They've thought through the process, and yet they're not doing it. So why? So we have to identify those barriers, and over a period of years, obviously, this is not long, this is not short term. Work to address that to whatever extent possible. I think we also need to think about not creating new administrative barriers or work for our partners. Um, you know, there. Are, a lot of what we're trying to do now, because we're working within certain confines, um, is to you know to expand upon existing agreements, to think about ways that we can expand customs-related cooperation and other sorts of you know um, reduce trade barriers and do other things and and uh, you know all kinds of, of, of different initiatives are being proposed. Um, and I, I applaud those efforts to try and do something, but we want to make sure we're not just creating new work for our partners for the sake of doing so, and especially if it's not going to be a long-lasting partnership necessarily that, that they're engaging in. Um, I mean, focus. We just need to focus. Obviously, we're coming with fewer resources to bear, uh, to bringing fewer resources to bear. and. Um, I think to the extent that we can focus on a handful of initiatives, be it, I mean, obviously there's this new agreement with Costa Rica on the trusted networks, right? And so maybe that's one area of focus. Maybe critical minerals and electrification is another. Um, and again, there can be partnerships with, you know, with partner nations to try to do deals, you know, in these industries and then tie them um, to the Infrastructure Act here, for example, and thereby create, facilitate supply chain development, but ways to incentivize more use of U.S. or partner nation, uh, you know, company, technologies, products, services, things of this nature, it needs to be thought through, but I think the idea is to focus very extensively on, on a handful of, of, of critical and emerging sectors. Um, this is, I mean, we have to incentivize new investment, but another issue is divestment. So many companies are leaving. I mean, it's not just that they're not coming, they're leaving, and so a lot of, I mean, the energy assets, right? If we're talking dams, if we're talking electricity transmission, that's because companies have left. I'm not just talking about US companies, but they're shedding Latin American assets from their global portfolios. And so it's a matter of stopping the bleeding too, right? And then I've always, you know, figured that, it, uh, and actually Benjamin's made this wonderful point, Gadan right here, um, but that, you know, the, the US is very well positioned to add value when you look at the the, our trade dynamics, when you look at the investment that, that U.S. companies do, it's in a much more diverse set of sectors and industries. Um, we do a lot of training, we do a lot of engagement and a lot of technical cooperation, even in ways that China is not doing, despite the fact that it's ramping this activity up, right? So we do add value. So we need to communicate that, A, but also think about the ways in which our investments, our strategic investments, our targeted investments can make that case and indeed do that. Um, and and think about that as, as a way to, I think, brand a lot of what we're trying to do in the region. And then finally, you know, the military that is doing an amazing job of showing up in the region. 
and showing commitment. But what we're not seeing, and I think this is a global phenomenon, it's, just not, it's not just a Latin America one, is the economic officials are showing up. And again, just as Cynthia mentioned, these are the, it's economics, it's recovery, right? And so they have to be there too, and they have to be there consistently. And we're seeing that from China. They're not, I mean, it's the economic officials stepping off the plane. Huge delegations of business people following them, right? So this is another really critical component of what needs to be done, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. So, Ryan, you're insulate, curtail, and compete. If you turned it into an acronym, it's ICK. We should be ICKY in, in Latin America, yeah. Caribbean. But or we should be with the ICC. Or the ICC, <laughs> the International Criminal Court. Um, but go ahead and explain, from your point of view, from your writings, what you think the U.S. could be doing. Uh, thanks, Tony, and thanks to the panelists for for plugging the the paper. I promise I haven't uh, paid them to, uh, to to do so. I mean, the the paper uh, really just arose from this question of like everyone recognizes the fact that we need to compete. Everyone recognizes the fact that you know China presents a challenge. Uh, how do we think about it? The paper is really a response to that question. How can we kind of sketch out as the subtitle of the paper is sketching a grand strategy? for Latin America and the Caribbean. How can we sketch out different, uh, let's call them buckets, like ways that we can think about various strategies um, with this? And I think the, the largest bucket is the first one, the insulation strategy. Um, we can't compete everywhere, right? We can't compete everywhere and always. And so the insulation strategy is probably the largest bucket. And it is looking at vulnerabilities in the region surrounding questions like weak and un unconsolidated democracies, where we've seen China, both in the region and also in other regions of the world, build leverage, get concessions, uh, use you know, sort of opaque processes to, uh, to, as a main feature of their engagement. And so we should seek to build out better democracies in the region, as President Biden says, democracies that deliver for their people. Uh, functioning governments, institutions that are actually uh, uh, not corrupt, uh, transparent, and so on. And those are insulation strategies. So we're really just trying to reduce the, 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 the level of asymmetry that exists between uh, China and the region and allow the region to engage slightly more on its own terms. We need to recognize the fact that there's asymmetry irrespective of which country the region deals with. There's asymmetry in the US relationship with the region. There's asymmetry in the Chinese relationship with the region. What we should seek to do is show that the asymmetry in our direction is one that's not predatory and one that, that actually leads to, to, to good outcomes. And that's what the insulation strategies are about. The second bucket is curtailment. So that is where we're actually going to think strategically about some of those areas where we would make an ask of our partners and say, hey, we have a concern with the uh, type of engagement that you have with China on this issue. By definition, these have to be very, very limited. Right? We, not everything can be a curtailment strategy. Um, you have to think about those industries, those areas that are extremely important that may, in fact, uh, be critical to the future of global economic governance, the future of, of, of global uh, influence. They might be in those sectors that Margaret uh, mentioned earlier, which China previously called new technologies. It now doesn't call new technologies that much anymore. Uh, but we need to have that conversation within the strategy conversation about where would be those areas where we would make that ask. And ideally, then, you marry those curtailment strategies with the third bucket, which is competition. You actually uh, take the resources that we have allocated in the development space and the financial and technical assistance space in the US and you actually make alternatives possible so that you're not just making a request of countries in the region, for example, to not go with Huawei. In other words, incur a huge cost to your people, to your population, to your political position in the country just to please the United States. No, you marry that strategy with a competition strategy that actually subsidizes Ericsson or Nokia or another com competitive company that will offer, offer the alternative. So the paper in essence, tries to, to look at uh, these three things as kind of like buckets, you know, ways to think about how we would group uh, various approaches and, and strategies vis-a-vis -vis China in, in the region. And one final comment on the, on the issue of China's sort of uh, semi-capitalist or, or party state, as it's often described, model versus US private sector-led growth. Um, we're at a short to medium-term disadvantage 
right? We can't just point to this large pool of capital as the Chinese can and say, hey, you're going to invest here. Why? Because we say you're going to. Um, but we have really strong reasons to believe that that's a largely inefficient use of capital long term, right? And we don't have a, a model that prioritizes that level of state control because we have reason to believe that it's not going to be efficient. But it does make us in the short and probably in the medium term at a slight disadvantage because the private sector wants to see rule of law. They want to see security of contracts. They want to see things now even beyond free trade agreements. They want to see frameworks, for example, as the administration is trying to set up with the region. They want to see commitments to certain principles and, idea, and, and ideals before they will get into the game in any substantial way. And that takes a long time to set up. You've got to, you've got to sort of till the field, so to speak, before, before we'll find fertile soil for, for that. Um, so we're, we're at a competitive disadvantage in, in the short to medium term, but I'm confident that in the long term, if things don't go completely sideways, uh, that the private sector-led capital approach will find fertile soil because we will set up some frameworks. We will have a number of countries insisting on, on certain uh, rules of the game that the private sector in the US is, is more happy to abide by than, than the Chinese state-owned enterprises. That's just my, perhaps it's wishful thinking, but it's, it's, my, it's my hope, but it's also my belief. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I believe I have time to get a round of questions from the, from the audience. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, um, and I know that many of you are ready to jump in, and maybe we could take a number of questions at once to, to give them back to the, to the panelists. I have to say that I think Cynthia, we lost her on Zoom, so you, 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 can, you can ask uh, a I'm question. Here. Oh, Cynthia, I'm okay, back. thank here. you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> see you there. Out for some reason. I thought it the connection out. came oh, down. I'm hoping to stay on. So I stand corrected. You can que you can ask a question to one or all of the uh, panelists that have spoken. Um, feel free to jump in. Uh, Nicole has the microphone. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Benjamin Gadan from the Wilson Center. How are you? And thank you so much for this great conversation. I wanted to ask you, Admiral, just a question of where these issues stack up given other U.S. interests and challenges worldwide. So I think everyone in this room is interested in this region and recognizes, you know, what we consider a pretty urgent geostrategic challenge right now that we face with China. But the same is true with China virtually anywhere on Earth. Thinking back to your time at the Pentagon and at Southcom, you know, where truly did this stack up relative to the challenge of China elsewhere in the world? And what resources realistically are available to carry out a strategy such as the one Ryan recommends? I think we need a strategy beyond the, the large strategic documents. Um, and uh, we need one that recognizes that as the global power, the U.S. has, has to act globally. And uh, it's unfortunate when we use narratives like pivot to the Pacific or prioritize the Indo-PACOM theater because that doesn't do uh, justice to what we should be representing, which is the leader of democracy and ideas and education, and there's so much we can do with that. Um, as a combatant commander, it was a, it was a daily fight for what I thought was enough resources. And I would say to my boss, Secretary of Defense, look, I'm not asking for more time or attention or money or stuff, that's a fancy word for ships, planes, things like that, <laughs> than, uh, than what my counterpart in the Pacific wants. I'm just asking for something. We uh, conducted a combatant commander review, which is a lot of words for, we're going to look at what your budget is, what you do, and see if there can be uh, things shifted around. And uh, I pointed out to the Secretary of Defense that Southcom was 0.01% of the Department of Defense budget. So we could do a review, but z I'm, a, I'm a math guy. Zero in any math equation is either zero or infinity. That's how I started my brief. Uh, <laughs> so I said, I'm not sure what you're saying. I'm saying, sir, you're not going to find much savings at Southcom. We need some more, and I'll offer a few modest reasons. And, and uh, areas where we could get some more exercise money, education money, those sorts of things. So we can target resources if we have a global view and invest in those things that are that play to the strength of the U.S. military and, frankly, that are representative of our society. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a challenge. We, we need to shift the paradigm and think globally. 
uh, and not narrow down to a hierarchy of partners. So certainly we've got to apply resources where they can best make a difference. We also have to undercome, overcome when we talk to the larger um, U.S. government, to the other policymakers, this sort of lingering suspicion that somehow the U.S. military is seen as a bad influence in Latin America and the Caribbean. There, there is certainly history there that needs to be understood and recognized, but it is history. And uh, there, there's certainly we have to deal with the detention facility in Guantanamo Bay and some of the unfortunate legacy of that. But I found routinely that there was a lot of respect and that, as Margaret said, thank you, the mil U.S. military is act an action-oriented organization. We're out there like doing stuff and engaging in exercises and education. Uh, our partners care about that. They want to work with us. Exercises being you know, a way they can practice with us. So thank you. Thanks, Admiral. There's two questions in this corner in the room. I think Leyland and then uh, on the table. And then maybe we could take a round of these three. Um, if you could be yeah, fairly concise. Thanks. So my question has to do with um, going back to messaging and continuity, right? So this September is going to be the 10th anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Ten years of a, of a continuous policy that's global. Um, meanwhile, I think on the Trump administration, we had America Crece, and then when the Biden came along, you had B3W, and then you have APEP, right? Uh, America Prosperities of Economic... Erica, America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. You know, should we just go back to, you know, good neighbor policy 2.0 or, you know, partners of the Americas under the Kennedy administration? What's your viewpoint on that? Could I ask the panelists just to, put, you know, hold that thought and we'll take a couple of the questions and then you can come back and answer one of them. Hi, uh, Michael Parlberg from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University and the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, recognizing the limits that we have compared to China. China, you know, is able to direct state resources. Also, um, China is willing to do business with anyone, um, including dictatorships, that we may be, uh, you know, more reticent to, uh, to do business with. Um, but also thinking about some of the historic limits that we've had, we tend to look at Latin America through the lens of basically drugs and migration, and as a, as a region of unwanted uh, drugs and people, basically, and China generally does not have to see the region through that lens. But there's a flip side of that, which is that we have um, a certain amount of uh, soft power and, and a lot of links, and um, I'm wondering what kind of soft power things we could be doing and putting into action a little bit. I mean, just as an example, Central America, the region I, I study, um, foreign direct investment is between one and two percent of the GDP. So when the vice president is putting, you know, whole plans like get Coca-Cola to invest in El Salvador, I just I don't. It's a drop in the bucket. It's not going to make a huge difference. What's twenty-five percent of the GDP in these countries? It's, mm. it's remittances, right? And those are coming from the U.S. It's coming from people with family members there, and that creates a great deal of not just, you know, it, it gives uh, an economic uh, boost to the countries, but it also creates soft power uh, for the U.S. So are there ways that the U.S. can can leverage that? Yeah. And just. Just one more thing, uh, in Dundam, given the, the drugs thing. Uh, this is something I don't know. What is the role of China in terms of uh, facilitating corruption? Uh, one thing I'm, I'm worried about is, particularly with El Salvador, the country I focus on the most, there's just a lot of uh, uh, questionable flows of money. Um, and I, I imagine that a lot of the motivation to engage has some uh, illicit uh, sides to it as well. Thank you, Michael. If we could just take one final question, and then I'll throw it back to the panel, give you each a chance to respond. Uh, thanks to the panelists. I'm uh, Larry Dachten, and I uh, consult, write research on Latin America. Uh, coming back to the sort of BRI question, and and I wonder what the panel's view on is to the extent to which that people in the region are realizing this is not a relationship of parity, and not even close to being that. Because if we look at the countries that are not in it, it's not just only U.S. and Canada; it's also the other two big. Uh, economies of the Western Hemisphere, Brazil and Mexico. In Brazil's case, uh, obviously BRICS provides that kind of relationship of parity with the Development Bank and everything everything else. In Mexico's case, if Mexico were to join, not only it might not mesh very well with AMLO's ideas of uh, Mexican sovereignty, but it would also uh, make his double act in the, react in the direction of the United States much, much more difficult. So, I mean, I guess the, you know, one set of questions is precisely that. Do you think other countries are, other people in other countries are realizing what kind of relationship this is? And then 
what if you know one of these four countries were to move in the direction of the BRI? I don't think the United States would be the first one, but uh, if you know one of them were to move, what would the reaction be? And I'm not leaving out Canada entirely because Huawei, for example, for a long time was an open question uh, on also on the Canadian front. Thanks. If I could just, if, if you can indulge me, panelists, I'll just reverse the order, let Ryan respond and then go through the, have, give you each a chance to respond to some element of those questions. Yeah. I'll just take kind of a smattering and try to answer a couple at a time and hopefully leave, leave some stuff for, for fellow panelists. So uh, first on the issue of, of BRI, um, 10th anniversary, I think, uh, you know, in September, I imagine quite a few people in this room, I'm kind of looking at them right now, you know, together we might even be writing some op-eds, uh, yeah, okay, uh, about, you know, what it means uh, and what it's going to mean moving, what it meant, what it, what it currently means and what it's going to mean moving forward. Um, and especially if a country like Brazil or Mexico uh, joins the BRI, Colombia as well, most likely, um, It'll be another opportunity for us to, to re-examine, but I'm not so sure that this is that big of a deal from a sort of influence and overall bilateral economic relationship standpoint. Say, for example, with Brazil, um, sure, it's going to provide another reason for us to you know write analyses and talk about the, the role of the BRI. But Brazil was the top destination for Chinese FDI in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, right? irrespective of the fact that it was not in, in BRI. So it's, there's still a ton of economic activity taking place between Brazil and China, whether it's in the BRI or whether it's not. Uh, China's already remade the Brazilian economy uh, in a way that touches deforestation and all sorts of other things that we, we care a lot about. Um, so that question is sort of less important to me, is in addition because I think there's a real question about the viability of BRI moving forward, as Margaret has alluded to and done plenty of really excellent work on. To what extent is this going to remain a centerpiece of China's foreign policy engagement moving forward as some of the bad press and uh, policy concerns have, have come out on it, um, it is a, really an open question, I think. And as the Chinese themselves are understanding that there's such thing as geopolitical risk. Right? We sunk $62 billion into Venezuela and we can't get our money back. What happened, right? And you know, they're now realizing that there's some there's some serious risk to uh, to to the strategy, and they themselves are are pulling back a little bit and reevaluating what's feasible and what's not. Um, on the question of continuity, I think this is a really important question um, because, you know, as a social scientist. I, it would be really nice if we'd got a if we would get a policy experiment that would last more than like two or three years, so that we could do some tests on whether it worked well or not. Um, with respect to like Central America, we get a different policy every four years, right? We had CAFTA DR in the early 2000s, which, in my opinion, was a very nice achievement, uh, but ended up entrenching to some extent uh, ruling elites and insular uh, business class in in much of Central America. Then we tried in the Obama administration during the child migrant crisis to go with a really impressive uh, humanitarian aid package, $3 billion. There wasn't enough civil society in the country to absorb all that, in the Northern Triangle particularly, to absorb all of that money. Then in the Trump administration, there was a, a more punitive approach taken. Some of the aid that had been passed through appropriations was taken back. Uh, and then later in the administration, there was the idea of America Crece, there wasn't enough time for, for that to really get off the ground in any meaningful way. Uh, and now we're back to an approach that's looking at foreign assistance married with the Partnership for Central America, so public-private sector investment. We've got a more impressive top-line number. We went from three to you know, four billion in discussion. But we have this like whipsawed approach, and a lot of it has to do with, with politics, and domestic politics in the US. And so uh, I'll go back to an oldie but goodie. You know, Arthur Schlesinger wrote this great book called The Vital Center, right? And that, that's a, a classic piece that I usually have my students read in, in my course at Catholic uh, to understand that there used to be a very broad center where the majority of Americans were on foreign policy issues. And that allowed us a sort of, a, a, at least a, a capacious enough area of sort of continuity between administrations, Democrat and Republican, that we actually had a policy that didn't change so drastically every four to eight years. Rebuilding that, I think, is going to be vital to actually having policies that can work and can, and can have any sort of duration that, um, 
resonates with the region. The region knows every four years we're pulled in this direction, then we're pulled in that direction. It makes it really difficult to have any kind of meaningful, deep engagement over time. Uh, rebuilding the vital center, I think, is, is critical to being able to you know, broaden out that engagement and have policies that last longer than Thanks, four to Ryan. eight years. Just that description makes, it, makes me realize how long ago that was that we had that kind of center. Um, so, so um, Margaret, there's, there's the question about strategy, question about soft power and corruption, and question about the Belt and Road Initiative. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll try and be brief. Um, I agree entirely with Ryan on the... I mean, this 10th anniversary will be as much an opportunity to highlight the successes of the BRI, I mean, for China to highlight the successes of the BRI as it is to reevaluate, um, rethink the BRI and its effectiveness, its efficiency, and that's already happening in China. We've seen a lot of efforts. I mean, we saw the consolidation of all of the banks, an effort to sort of centralize decision-making um, you know, uh, among the banks to control more extensively what they're doing overseas, given that there are fewer resources to bring to bear. We saw new 2020 guidelines, which suggest that Chinese companies should maybe adopt international standards. They don't say what international standards are, but nevertheless, this sort of rethinking of, of how to do things, especially infrastructure development overseas, given that the BRI has contributed to a lot of reputational risk over time. And so there have been a number of new initiatives announced in parallel to the BRI, the National, uh, um, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, which are intended to carry out other more cooperative functions and wider ranging sort of diplomatic functions uh, that ideally for China will not, uh, you know, encounter the same sort of push back occasionally, right, or, or incur the same sort of um, reputational or operational risks. Um, I, I mean, other than that, though, I mean, it doesn't matter if you join the BRI, <laughs> frankly. You know, you're still going to get, especially for Brazil, large economies, especially for the U.S., Canada, you're still going get to get investment. And in fact, a lot of the BRI deals happened before the BRI even started in 2013, right? So it's more an effort. It's, it's, it's PR, right? It's a really good PR campaign. Unfortunately, Leland, you've, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Is concerned. We are not good at continuity on these things. We continue to shift our messaging. And I think that you know, has a very negative effect on perceptions of what we are doing in the region and whether we have a strategy at all to bring to bear. I don't know what, how to approach that, but uh, but you know it is problematic the way that we message on our own you know initiatives in in the region um, soft power uh, yeah I mean we have considerable advantages I think in this in this respect we need to bring them to bear there there's so many things that I could mention but one is that you know China has really upped its game on area studies it is reaching out it in unprecedented ways to universities across the region establishing all sorts of networks providing grants, providing um, scholarships, donating entire centers. I, I, there was one uh, friend of mine at, at uh, University of Chile that said, you know, the Chinese came and they said that we can have whatever we want. What should we do? And I thought, <laughs> my gosh, you know, well, what do you do with that, especially if you're a university that needs some things, right? And nothing is there, there's no such thing as free. Um, and so, I mean, this is what we're dealing with. And there's also a strategy well-defined by Xi Jinping and others, including the Ministry of Education, uh, to be the top provider of international education, especially for the global south, right? There are these policies underway. And so competing with that, as we shouldn't be reactive, right, always. We should have our own strategy. Strategies, but we do have wonderful mechanisms in place, Fulbright and others, right? To, and we need to reinforce those, re-up those, encourage, you know, um, these programs to, to continue operating in really effective ways across the region. And this is just one area that I can think of, but there are lots of others. Um, and then on corruption, I mean, look, yes, I mean, there are plenty of examples of this happening of, you know, shopping trips and, and bags of money and, and all sorts of anecdotes, you know, that circulate and... Um, one issue here is that it take, I mean, corruption is pervasive in much of the region, regardless of China's engagement, right? So it's a bigger issue, and especially as concerns infrastructure development. You talk about big infrastructure projects, or there's likely to be a problem with corruption at some phase in the development. I mean, Odebrecht is a perfect example of this, right? So it's not a purely China, China problem. The issue is that China doesn't have the same views of corruption as, as many others do. They don't have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. They see corruption as greasing the wheels, as facilitating it 
investment. And so, you know, our, our, our keen on making things happen, and if a few gifts and a few trips and uh, some kickbacks make it happen, then all the better. Um, and so, uh, but again, this depends largely, it's a two to tango situation. It depends on the regulations in place in countries and the extent to which they are enforced. And again, these are two very different things, right? So they have to be there and they have to be enforced. And when that happens, you don't see as much of the, this, this problem. Otherwise, you know, it can be really quite pervasive and, and a huge problem and with broad effect on wide-ranging stakeholders. And I'll just stop there. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Cynthia, I'm glad we didn't lose you. Uh, you, you I know that you heard the questions. You, you're free to give some final reflections on the themes that w were brought up with the questions. Yes, well, great, great questions. And I would say, uh, first, you know, it's important that the United States not not overreact, no, not resort to, to heavy handedness because you know both in the questions and I think it was 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 Ryan, uh, we do have a lot of prestige. We do have a lot of soft power uh, you know, in the region. When I'm in South America, I mean many people want to go to China to study and I agree with Margaret that more uh, educational opportunities in the United States should would be terrific. Uh, but, you know, people still really prefer the United States and people don't know Chinese. It's a very different country for them. And there's a lot of networks in the United States. And I think, as Ryan mentioned, you know, over the longer term, uh, the United States model will work better. And following up a little bit on Margaret, I think, uh, at least in Peru, maybe not in the authoritarian or author the authoritarian countries, but but here, you know, China is being caught, uh, you know, smoothing the way, greasing the wheels, does get it into trouble. It does hurt its soft power, you know, and I think people, my own impression is that, you know, people in South America, one, they're not all that informed, but to the extent that they're informed about the issues, they, they do see this as a, you know, they don't see China as, you know, this wonderful benevolent country. They're aware that great powers have their interests and, no, so again, for, for the United States to have a little confidence that, um, no, we, we have a lot of strengths. I, I would, a couple of things I'd suggest, I was thinking, I think, again, to some of the questioners were jesting it, uh, working on our situation at home. And uh, one set of rules that is tremendously confounding to me, and probably the Admiral would agree with, is that, you know, we, often we don't have ambassadors in all the countries even because they're being held up in the Congress. So if something could be done in that, maybe longer terms, I was thinking, you know, in order for us to achieve, quote, branding, you no, know, we need ambassadors who have good connections with media folks. And to do that, we need ambassadors who've been around for a while. So maybe... You know, trying to extend these terms, getting people who are really in place and can uh, get some of the good news out there a little bit, you know, uh, better. Thank you, Cynthia. Admiral Fowler, it's here. I'm smiling and cringing both at your comment on Ambassador. After one Senate hearing, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Armed Services Committee came up to me and said, Admiral, what would you recommend for a grand strategy? You know, I think a Ryan and grand strategy along the lines of, um, you know, Latin America. I said, Senator, confirm our ambassadors. <laughs> Pass a budget on time and be consistent. And they, what do you, what do you mean by that, Admiral? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so to, to address the points here, we, we um, in the military, we're taught to you know, confuse and deceive our enemy, not ourselves. Our changes in policy and strategy every year and not passing a budget on time to Leland's very thoughtful question argues for some consistency and simplicity so that we can understand it, the practitioners within the, the U.S., and, and certainly maybe we'll have a chance of having our partners understand it too. On soft power, double down on education. It's what we do. We do it well. But the, if you take a deep look at some of our education budgets in State Department, Department of Defense, they, 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 don't even, they never increase at all, let alone for the inflation and cost of of that, of what it costs to educate a student. So you're, you're educating fewer and fewer students year on it. And China sees this, they are mimicking our courses and they're improving their courses, both in Portuguese and Spanish language and elsewhere. So uh, that's another one. To the comment about transnational criminal organizations, corruption. Before I took the job as Southcom commander, I would not have listed corruption as one of the top threats. Certainly is one of the top threats. 
It is what fuels the transnational criminal organizations, which drives the instability here uh, in this hemisphere, our wonderful neighborhood. Uh, and it's not just drugs that the transnational criminals feed off of. It's everything and drugs. So whatever, extortion, uh, you know, bribery, human trafficking, so on. One of the primary sources of revenue for transnational criminal organizations, Chinese money laundering. There's a lot of cultural similarities to what transnational criminal organizations thrive on and what the PRC thrives on. And Margaret made that point quite well. We need to do more to educate people on that and illuminate it, the facts associated with that uh, when we get them. I just wanted to, we, we're about out of time. I know that Carlos uh, is going to give us some final remarks, but I wanted to thank every member of the panel for very thoughtful comments. I know a lot of us are going to be following what you write and what you say in the next months and years, um, given your knowledge of this, of this issue. Thank you. Carlos Becerra with FIU in Washington. Just to underscore uh, our thanks to uh, Dr. Pereira on behalf of uh, uh, Interim Dean Dinar, uh, Admiral Fowler, you're proving once again it's great to have you uh, as a fellow here at uh, uh, FIU and considering a lot of the work that a lot of our, in addition to our academics and our researchers, our teams at the Gordon Institute led by Leland and uh, our colleagues Brian Fonseca are uh, leading with the Security Research Hub and Central American Security, that much of that collaboration was really propelled during your time at uh, Southcom. Uh, also to thank our, uh, our wonderful partners, CSIS, the Elliott School, uh, the Dialogue, these are uh, great representations of uh, collaborators. I see uh, uh, Maggie uh, Gessler from the House Foreign Affairs Committee here, glad to have you uh, join us. And our uh, wonderful alum, Jennifer Rivera Galindo, works for uh, 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 Chairman uh, Menendez on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, as well as uh, Guillermo Arias, a uh, great uh, uh, alum and uh, a friend of FIU and DC with uh, BMW Latin America. So thank you all, and uh, I believe we have a reception following this, and glad to have you all here today. Thank you. Thank you.